morning, Richland Creek. For those of you in the room and also those of you worshiping online, we want to say welcome this morning and just uh, open up our hearts to the Lord as we set our hearts on worship today, reading from the book of Revelation. As we welcome you here today, pause for a second. I don't know what your mind was fixed on as you tuned in this morning or came here on campus, but if we could reorient our thoughts for just a moment onto the Lord God himself. Revelation chapter 4 says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He is not only our creator, he is our sustainer. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, and we worship him here in this place today. We set our hearts and our affections and our thoughts on him. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we are thankful that we can call on your name, the one who is holy, 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 the one who is worthy of our praise and our adoration. So Father, help us in this moment, in this service, but Lord, even beyond that, in our very lives to set our affections, our hearts on you. We thank you. Lord, for the privilege to worship you, to know you, to call on your name. And we do just that in this place today, the body of Christ unified in our love and adoration and worship of you. We pray all this in Christ's strong and matchless name. Amen. Part of that scripture that he just read said, worthy is our Lord God. And he is, he's worthy of all of our praise. And there's no name that's higher than his name. And he is worthy of all of our praise. And so this morning, and we're going to be singing songs of just our worship to him and, and lifting up his name. And so please stand with us as we start our time of worship. Could have 
kagising-gisingan. Howdy. Good morning. That was good. You guys are doing good for a holiday. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, we do. Uh, I'm, my name is Jim Gillespie. I'm pastor here of Equipping, and we are going to pray and thank God uh, for our freedom, and uh, for this country, and ultimately for our salvation. Um, I have been around the world, both as a soldier and a pastor, I have literally been around the world. And no one experiences the freedom we do in this country. This is the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. And we should take this time as we celebrate this holiday um, to think about and thank God uh, for our personal freedom. But even more, even more, we need to take this time and thank God for our salvation, our freedom from sin and death and the grave. And this is a freedom we couldn't fight for, a freedom we could not earn. It is a war that we could not be part of because we were sinners. Instead, Christ came, all God, all man, born of a virgin, living a sinless life, dying in our place having that victory in the resurrection and then offering that to us as a gift that we might be truly, truly free in the victory of Jesus. I read John 8, 34 through 36, Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son, the children, they do remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Heavenly Father, dear God, we thank you for this freedom. We thank you for this country. We thank you for the freedom that we have here as Americans, this great, great country that you have placed us in, that, that we could be wealthy beyond the dreams of the rest of the world, that we could take that wealth, this time that you have given us, this freedom that we have in this country, that we might know you and take you to the world, present your gospel to every being on the face of the earth. Use these resources you've given us, not for ourselves and our own gain, but for your glory and your honor and your praise. It is your victory, your glory, your honor, your praise. We are free. We are free in this room because you have set us free and we are free indeed. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. As we look to the cross and all that Christ did for us on the cross, we're humbled. We're humbled because he died for our sins, just as Pastor Jim was talking about, what all that he did. And he suffered and died for us, but that's not the end of the story. He rose again, and, and we celebrate that. And um, when we meditate on these truths, our response should be, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. So please stand with us as we continue our time of worship.
give him praise this morning. You may be seated. Good morning to all of you today. If you have your copy of God's Word with you today, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, happy Independence Day. It's good to see you here in church, those who are here on a July 4th weekend at church. And I have a feeling there's a few that have their toes in the sand and maybe watching us online today as well. So I want to say welcome to all of you that are joining us for worship today and are a part of these few moments here we're going to spend in God's Word. And just a reminder, on a weekend like this, as we celebrate our freedoms as Americans, it's, it's a reminder that the freedom we have is a, is a gift of the gospel. We have an ability and, and uh, an openness to be able to speak the gospel wherever we go. And so there are many countries in this world uh, where if you were to go and try to see somebody come to faith in Christ, you could be thrown in prison, thrown out of the country, could be even a risk of your life. And so this is one of those responsibilities that comes with our freedom. And having the gospel in our hands is something that we should be doing. And, and as we go, taking advantage of those freedoms and sharing uh, our faith as we go. And so that's, that's one of those things we see on a weekend and on a day like today, we're reminded of what the Lord has gifted us to be able to share the gospel. Now we're in Philippians 2 today, and last week we began with those first few verses talking about humility and unity as a church, and, and really these two passages go together. I just didn't think I could preach them all in the amount of time we had. In fact, some preachers even split this passage in two parts. Uh, so there's actually two halves to today, but uh, as we look at this text, it's, it's one of, in the Bible, there are four major Christological passages, or four major passages in the New, New Testament that talk about Jesus. Colossians 1 is, is uh, one of them that I just preached here a few weeks ago on my first Sunday, and you, you can go to John chapter 1, that famous passage of God with us. And then, then you go to Hebrews 1 and you look at Jesus there. But Philippians 2 is one of those uh, passages. And so we're going to take these few verses here and it, it's, it's beautiful language, talking about the Lord Jesus. We're going to take that, look at Jesus today, see his example of humility. And so if you have your co copy of God's Word open, would you please stand in honor of the reading of his Word? And now I want to give you the outline before I read it. So as I read it, you might hear the sections. Verse 5 is the introduction. You're supposed to think like Jesus. You're supposed to have his mind. But then there's two halves to this. The first half of 6 through 11 uh, talks about Jesus' descent from heaven down to the cross. So think about like an airplane flying at 30,000 feet, coming down from the heavens. Jesus comes down, touches on the runway in a sense. He hits, there's the cross. But then after we do that, there's the ascension back to glory. And so just in your mind, get this picture of how Jesus will come down to us and then ascend back to the right hand of the Father. So beginning, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, the Word of God says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us a glimpse of your servant Jesus. That Lord, as we see his humility, we would be able to lay aside our rights and be servants like your son. So Lord, help us to see him today. And then ultimately, Lord, we pray that that we would all bow the knee in worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, one of the first words we all learn as a baby or a child is the word no. We don't like to be told what to do. Even from a very young age, you see the independent spirit in a child when you tell them something to do and they learn very quickly how to say no. We give all kinds of reasons for saying no, but at at the core level, we don't don't like to be told what to do. You know, with, with three kids, I have learned there are times that no comes out more than others. Typically at bath time, bedtime, and cleaning time, my favorite, uh, no shows up in all kinds of different ways. It's amazing how they can run around the house for an hour, but then the moment it's time to clean, they develop ailments that rival the deathbed. That they find ways to have tired legs and hurt, hurt minds. They, they have a headache. They don't feel good. All of a sudden, at that moment, when it's time to do what you don't want to do. You know, we, we as people have a way about, about giving other reasons than the real reason we don't want to do something. You know, if, if, you, if you talk to many people about why they're not Christians. And you say, why is it that you don't believe or you don't follow Christ? You'll get all kinds of reasons. But, but I'm convinced at the core of those reasons is the fact they do not want to be told what to do by the Lord Jesus. They're unwilling to what, what the text says here, to bow their knee to God himself. Not willing to listen See, this is the real reason people reject the faith. They, they no longer desire to bow the knee. But what's amazing about when God calls us to submit in humility is that he has led us in humility before us. Christ has given us an example in being humble in a way that we would not have known without him coming to earth. And that humility in Christ is what we're called to have. Look at verse 5 with me. Have this mind, so this is the way way we should think, among yourselves. So you're supposed to have this mind as a Christian, but but it's a you should think of this like a church corporate way to do it. He says not just have your mind yourself, but as a body of Christians, as a body of believers, you should have this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we as a church are supposed to have this mind of Christ, and then because of Christ, it's been gifted to us. So you have, you and I had this ability to live out this humility that Jesus has because he's given it to us. So we're called to have this mind of humility, and it is gifted to us in Christ Jesus because followers of Christ have the mind of Christ. That's what it means to follow him, is you have his mind. So what I want to do is unpack. That's Paul's point here. He's said, be humble. Don't think of your own rights. He gets to verse 5. He says, says, here's the mind you ought to have. 
And then he gives this example in verses 6 through 11. So that's what we're going to do today is walk through 6 through 11 and looking to the mind of Christ. If you're taking notes, here's the first way we should have the, the mind of Christ. Christ gives us the mind of humility. Christ gives us the mind of humility. We talked a lot about humility last week and how we need to be humble before God. But here in this text, Christ is the king who leads his troops to battle. And he says, I'm going on the front line of humility. So before I ask you to be humble, I'm going to show you how to humble yourself. That's what six through nine is. I've, I mentioned it earlier. We'll, we'll do this plane flight. I'll, I'll reference it several times so you get the picture. Christ, this, this text begins in the past with Christ in heaven. And there is this humility found as he descends to the cross that our, our minds can't, ev can't even comprehend. Our drops of humility pale in comparison to the ocean of humility that Christ will have. He is the example for us. So join me in this descent into how we should be like Christ. And so, so I'll just, I'll kind of outline it a little bit. I'll, I'll say how we should be like him in humility. And the first way we do that is like Christ, we lay aside our rights. But like him, we lay aside our rights. In verse six here, I wish I could explain the complexity. It, it, it's, a, it's a deep verse. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the general idea. If you think real hard, you're going to understand that the mind of Christ is deeper than our minds. Look at verse 6 with me. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. So, so what does it mean for Christ to be in the form of God? So he was in the form of God. So it's talking about the past. And it's talking about before he came to earth, before Christ was, in a sense, born or begotten. And so prior to that, he is in heaven. We don't know much about Christ and what he was like before his time on earth. But we do know he was with God. And here it says he was in the form of God. What, what it means is that in Christ is the essential nature of God. He's the, as Hebrews 1 tells us, the exact imprint of the nature of God. So even though it says form of God, what it means is that he was God himself. But then notice the next phrase. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he didn't count this equality, the fact that he was God, to his own advantage. So follow with me here, because this takes a little bit of thinking. He set himself on a path of self-denial, laying aside the rights of him being God himself. Now keep in mind, he's not laying aside his grasp of deity. Notice what it says. He doesn't count the equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he still is God. He just sets those rights aside. He no longer takes those things to his own advantage. In order for him to become fully man and walk this earth, he's got to place some of that to the side. And that's where this next phrase, which is even more challenging, it says he emptied himself. Now, few phrases in Scripture have been more debated than this one. Because some people take this to say, well, he just emptied himself of his deity. He, he took the God out and then he just became man. But we know that's not true, right? No, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus was any less God at this point. So what does it mean that he, he emptied himself? It meant that he, this was a voluntary exercise of lordship, meaning that here he is taking God himself and emptying himself into man. He, he comes in the form of man. It's best described by these next few verses as he lays aside his rights. But before we get there, Let's just pause on this first idea. What it means to be like Jesus and have the mind of Jesus is to have all the rights of his deity, but to lay them aside. That means as Christians, if we're, we're having the mind of Christ, 
We don't say, that's my right. We, for each other, are willing to lay aside our positions and our rights and in humility serve one another. That's the picture of Christ here. Let's keep pressing on it. Like Christ, we serve others. Like Christ, we serve others. Christ laying aside these rights led him to serving us. Notice what it means to empty himself. By taking the form of a servant. Christ taking on the form of a servant. Kent Hughes put it like this. Christ did not exchange the form of God for the form of a servant. Rather, he manifested the form of God in the form of a servant. He was already a servant, and now here he is manifesting himself as God in the form of a servant. Now, how did he serve us? Look at the next phrase. By being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He became man. He was born in the likeness of men, and he was found in human form form. Meaning that if you saw Jesus, there wouldn't be some weird glow about him. He wouldn't walk around with a halo on his head. You wouldn't think, oh, there's, there's the son of God walking around, right? If you, if you happen to be on the street seeing Jesus walking by, you would do like they said, isn't that, isn't that the carpenter? Don't we know him? Isn't that Mary's son? Don't, isn't, he, isn't he just a normal guy? He, he would have appeared as a normal man, because he was fully man. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, right? That God is with us. This is what we call the incarnation, that God is man. He has come to save us. Now, now think for a minute what a miracle this is. God himself with all the rights of God, uh, Jesus existing in heaven, now descending down on the earth. You think about how is God becoming man? The mystery of how God found in Jesus is him becoming or coming in human form. Think about the glories of what it means that Christ came to serve us and what it meant for God himself to walk this earth. But that wasn't his full descent. Like Christ, we obey the Father. His humiliation was not over. His humbling was not done. Look at what he did on the cross. It says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Keep in mind here that Jesus humbled himself. He wasn't humbled by other things. Most times for us, other people and other things humble us. Anybody ever experienced being humbled by something else? Usually if it's a, uh, something you like to do, it's a sport, it's a hobby, maybe it's cooking. Usually if I go into the kitchen and I try to start cooking, I'm typically humbled by the cooking activity I do. Right? As you fail in certain things in life, you're humbled by that thing. But Jesus did it different. He humbled himself. He's the acting agent because there is nothing in this universe that could humble him but himself. And he was obedient to the point of death. So so in other words, he wasn't obedient to death, but death was a part of the obedience to the Father. So here is God himself hanging on this cursed tree. He became sin for us and in the garden was sorrowful even to death. He died the most scandalous death. Here's God himself descending from heaven, hanging on a criminal's cross, and then hanging in shame. He hung there without his clothes before the watching world in the most humiliating possible way. You see, Paul's point in painting this picture from heaven to the cross is to understand what true humility is. It's giving of yourself and being willing to go all the way down for others. You see, nobody's ever shown humility like Jesus. Simply put, he is 
the inspiration for our humility. We are humble because he was humble. You know, I, I can convince myself, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm tired. I, I need to take it easy. But, but ultimately, when I see inspiration, I need to follow it. Let me, let me give you this example. I like to, um, if you've ever worked out with anybody, and if you've ever worked out by yourself or worked out with other people, you've experienced two different phenomena. If I'm by myself, I can come up with any reason to not work out. Amen? I mean, you wake up in the morning, you're like, it's raining. There's no need to go work out. You wake up in the morning, my knee hurts. I don't need to go do anything. But if you are with other people and you know they're counting on you, that gets you up. Then if you go and whatever it is, maybe it's running or whatever you do to work out, and you're next to the other person and they do 10 reps, you can't do six, right? When you see someone else go, it drives you to the next level. And so what Paul's saying is when it comes to humility, don't look at other people, look to Jesus, and all of a sudden you see how he serves, and you start saying, man, I, I need to serve others like him. And it's easy sometimes to look around and say, nobody else is doing it. Why would I be willing to give of my life for others because that person is not serving or this person isn't that way? Paul says, don't measure yourself by them. Measure yourself by the servant Jesus. And so when we think about humility, we think about serving each other, we think about Christ, how he came from heaven, came to earth, and served us by, by coming down to save us. So think about the flight, flight plan I put us on earlier, right? We're 30,000 feet, Jesus is existing. Here he is in heaven, he comes down, descends all the way to the cross. But you see, his humiliation did not stay there Here's the second thing you can, second point or second half of it is that Christ gives us the mind of worship. See, we have Christ's humiliation, the first half. This is Christ's exaltation because Christ gives us a mind to worship him. When his humiliation hit the depths of the cross, it was not over. That was the point that he began his exaltation, back to glory. And this is it, since I'm on the plane analogy for the day, when you take off, you go to the airport, your, your pilot does this slight, slow ascent. But I've watched, has anybody ever seen Air Force One take off? I've seen it live, I've seen it from a distance, but if you ever seen the president's airplane take off, and it's a big, big jet, you know, when, he, when that airplane gets right off the ground, that pilot turns that thing straight up in the air. You've never seen a big jet turn like that. that. That's the kind of ascent we're talking about here for Jesus. Is that once he hits this moment, Jesus now will be exalted by the Father. So let's look at it there, the second half, verse 9. Therefore, since Christ performed his work on the cross, God has highly exalted him. So, so since Christ has done this work here, since everything has happened prior, his humiliation, he's now going to highly exalt Jesus. This phrase, highly exalted, you could say super exalted. You could use that there. It's not just that he's going to exalt him. That's why I gave the picture of when Jesus now is going to be exalted, it's going to be done with intensity. So what is... This passage doesn't describe it, but the Bible describes Jesus' exaltation. From the tomb, Matthew 28, Jesus will what? Rise from the dead, his resurrection. Then just weeks later in Acts chapter 1, what will happen to him? Then his ascension. He'll then go back to be with the Father. Then in, in Acts chapter uh, 2, when Peter preaches at Pentecost, he'll describe Jesus as being at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 1 will then say, then we have this one who has been exalted to rule from the right hand of the Father. And then finally in Revelation 5, Jesus sits there with all of the host of heaven worshiping around him. So where we start when it says, therefore he has highly exalted him, we have this picture of Jesus coming from the tomb all the way back to the right hand 
of the Father. Now keep in mind, it wasn't that Jesus lacked his divinity along the way. It wasn't somehow that once Jesus got back to the right hand of the Father, he then had the power again. Jesus was fully God all the way through. It was just an exaltation to his seat of power. The same way as if the president, whether he's sitting in the Oval Office or they're sitting in a bunker somewhere in the corner of America, they're still the president of the United States. The power is still the same. The position is still the same, whether they sit in their seat of power or not. So simply put, Jesus is exalted and God all the way through. But then there's something that God bestows upon Christ. Look what it says here. He's bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Jesus has lots of names, does he not? He's the Prince of Peace, wonderful wonderful counselor. Emmanuel, God with us, good shepherd. There's a list of names I could keep going, could I not? But here, there is a name given to Jesus. Verse 11 tells us what it is. It's what everybody will say one day. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That's the name that is given above any other name name. It's the name when they would translate the Old Testament into Greek. When they would give the name for God himself, they would call him Lord. This is declaring his exaltation to be God himself. Now this, this all has been done. Everything we've described here, the first, first couple of verses, these, before we get to these last two, they're in the past. Jesus was highly exalted. He's right now at the right hand of the Father. He's right now praying for us, interceding on our behalf. That's where Christ is today. But there is a future part of this passage. It speaks about what one day will happen. And there's two responses we'll have to the exaltation of Jesus. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. This is a physical response. And then verse 11, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So at the name of Jesus, there will be a physical response, the bowing of the knee, And there'll be a verbal response. Every single person will declare Jesus is Lord. Now now let's wrap this up for a second. Is there any other means of you communicating something other than physical, nonverbal communication and verbal talking communication, right? Are, Are there any other ways you could communicate something? I can't think of any. Maybe you'll think of some. I'll hear about it after the service, I bet. But I think of two ways for me, nonverbal and verbal. And Jesus is going to cover both of them. You will declare him as Lord physically and verbally at the very end. So, so he will be that. And look who, who will declare it. Just, just Christians? No, nah, not just Christians. More than just Christians will declare it. Look at verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Think about this scene. Just just let it, just take it in as I describe it. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That means every rational being will bow the knee and declare Jesus as Lord. So, so that means that, that every angel and every demon will bow the knee. That's what it means like above the earth, heaven, and then below the earth. But it, it also means every single person for all of time will bow their knee before Jesus when it's all said and done. And look what they will declare. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Those three words are the gospel in three words. Jesus, the one who saves. Christ, here's the anointed one that God has sent to save. And Lord, this is the God we submit our lives to. So in one simple form, I can tell you that we have been separated from our God. And in this moment, he has sent his son, Jesus, the one who saves. He is the one who God has sent to save us from our sins. And he is Lord of our life. Jesus Christ is Lord. So what people will say in simple three words will be the gospel. Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single person on the planet, every rational being, Everybody you know. So think with me. Go all the way back in time. The earliest philosophers from Socrates and Aristotle, as smart as they were, Plato, they're going to bow the knee before the Lord Jesus. From Caesars to different rulers in all of history, kings, they'll all bow the knee to Jesus. Every president you can think of in U.S. history, every world leader from Adolf Hitler to Osama bin Laden will all bow their knee to Jesus. Every single person. That means your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, Maybe your family members. Every single person will bow their knee to Jesus. Let's press it in here. All of us here, whether you're a Christian or not, if you're listening, watching online, every single one of us will bow our knee to Jesus. One day that's coming. The, the, the only question is, will you do it today or will you wait to do it then? That's the question. Are you willing to bow your knee to Jesus today? You know, with my kids, um, I have a, as, a, as a dad, you get to where you do life lessons and uh, one of the big things we, a little saying in our house is the Powers family never gives up. We just say it over and over. We don't quit. We don't give up. And so um, that usually shows up about homework time. And uh, my, this past year, my littlest one was, it was homework time. It was her first year in school. And so, you know, it's just, homework's hard. I don't blame her, you know. And we sit down and she's just kind of melting over homework. She doesn't want to do it. And in my mind, she's very capable of doing it. So I remember the moment I come over to her, and, and uh, in fact, I end up getting down. I, I've got down on one knee. I bent down to talk to her, you know. She's there eye to eye with me, and I look at her, and I say, so you know what, sweetie, I, I know you can do it. She's like, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, right? And so I, I know you can do it, like, you're capable. And in fact, you're going to do it. I know it's going to happen. And so we're, we're going back and forth in this conversation. Go back. As I'm doing it, my oldest is there in the room. And I hear her, look, she looks around me and she smiles. And she says, she looks over at her and she says, listen, I've been through this conversation a few times. I know how it ends. Just do the homework. <laughs> Just do it. And maybe you're here today and your loved ones keep looking at you and say, I know how this thing ends. Just surrender to Christ. But they know what it means. You know, a lot of us in this room know what it means to surrender our lives to Christ. We, we can sit here and say, we, our testimony would be, just do it. We know how it ends. We know how long we fought the Lord, and we know what it was like when we finally gave in. 
So just bow your knee to the Lord. You know, I mentioned at the beginning, there's all kinds of reasons people give. I don't believe the Bible's true, or somebody hurt me at church, or somebody's done this to me. What I'm doing is peering through all of that and saying, I think those are smoke screens. And I think at the end of the day, are you willing to bow your knee to Jesus? I think that's the real question to pose today. And and what we're here to tell you is it's coming. The Bible just said it's going to happen for all of us. So why won't you do it? You say, I'm not willing to humble myself before God. Why would I do that? Why would I humble myself before him? Let me tell you something. Because you have the example of Jesus who is willing to humble himself for you. I think I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't come to him and say, I give. Look at what Jesus has done for you. Don't look at everybody else. Then the last thing I'll say, it's, it's interesting how the Lord works. Because I didn't, I didn't talk to Pastor Jim about the passage he read today from John chapter 8. The passage, John 8, really verse 32, you shall know the truth. The truth is Jesus, right? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And July 4th weekend, we think all about freedom. And you might be here saying, I won't bow the knee to Jesus because I knew as soon as I do that, that I give up my freedom and then he's the one who's ruling my life. Let me tell you something here today. That if you don't have Jesus ruling your life, the Bible says you have Satan is the one leading your life. You serve one of two masters, the Bible says. And so if you think real freedom is over here, sin is your master and you are following after the world. It's not freedom. The Bible says, if you know the truth, that being Jesus, the truth will set you free. So will you bow your knee to Jesus today? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we pray, just for a short moment, let's all visualize that day when we all bow before Jesus. What a glorious moment that will be. Heavenly Father, we ask right now You would do a work in our hearts. Make us humble before you because of what Jesus has done. Lord, I pray for those in this room here that are not believers, they're not followers of Christ. Lord, by your grace, might you turn their hearts away from their sins. Help them to repent of that sin and trust Jesus as their Savior. Lord, help us. Help us by your power worship you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we respond today, maybe it's your first time here. There's pastors and train leaders down front. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe the Lord's been dealing with you. You realize that today's your day of salvation. Maybe it's online. Maybe you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. We, we would We would love to be able to pray with you today and you to make that decision, I'm going to follow Jesus. But as we stand and sing, worship the Lord and respond to him as moved. Please stand and sing and respond to him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace my fears. Re-
You guys can be seated for just a moment as we prepare to dismiss. I'm reminded as Pastor Mike shares from this incredible passage that uh, there will be a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But there is a difference in the eternal destination. If you wait till that day, you will be eternally separated from the God who loves you and has extended his grace to you. Today is the day of salvation because his grace is offered to you afresh and anew today. If you're here in this place today, don't wait. Come forward, talk with a pastor, a ministry leader, your life group leader. But that is the most important decision you will ever make is to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternity, your eternal destination hangs in the balance of that decision. So we go out with that in mind, and many of us have made that decision here in this place today. Oh, that we would be like Christ as we humbly serve others. Where would he have you lead out in that service to others and be that example in someone else's life? As we prepare to dismiss, ushers will be at the back if you desire to, to give your offering, your tithes today. We are so thankful for your stewardship as you support the sending out of the gospel from this place. And again, if you have questions today, pastors and ministry leaders will be here across the front ready to receive you. As everybody else is heading out, you come talk to us if the Lord is laying something on your heart and your mind. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. We exalt you in this place today. Our knees bow and our tongues confess that Jesus, you are Lord. May we live 
this week with that in mind. We love you, old Jesus. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.